Hey guys, Alicia from Morning Hawk Creations. It's June, which means July's coming up quickly, and with that, it's going to be small works. Today's 8x10 tutorial is going to be a cheetah. Stick around. <laughs> Okay, so as I said, this tutorial is going to be part of my Small Works fundraiser for the Sheboygan Visual Artists. And the funds from this fundraiser go back into the Sheboygan Visual Artists and help with art education in Sheboygan. Uh, last year's contribution, I did a white bearded iris, an African lion, and a red fox. This year's first piece is going to be a cheetah. Now this is going to go from the rough color mapping all the way through to the finished piece. The size of this piece again is 8 by 10. The color palette includes burnt sienna, burnt umber, cadmium yellow, yellow oxide, raw sienna, raw umber, Mars black, and titanium white. After getting the line drawing copied onto the canvas, the first thing that I need to do is establish that rim lighting, which is featured on the left side of the subject. The rim lighting is when you have a bright glow around something that is created by placing the light source behind your subject. At this point, all we're doing is rough color mapping. We're not looking for great amounts of detail. So if your line drawing is the bones of your piece, then your underpainting becomes just as structurally important because this tells you where your colors need to come from and where they need to go to and they become the cartilage and the tendons creating movement from one area of your piece to another. Now as much as your gut may tell you don't mix ultramarine blue with yellow oxide because it makes green, that's exactly what I need to do to create the cooler areas that are not directly lit by the sun. If I were to use black to create the shadows, it would just create a muddy look rather than dynamic change of lighting. Now I'm not too worried if I paint over any of the graphite lines in this because they're going to show through, especially with like the spots. I'm going to go over this in several more glazing layers. And as I'm getting into the eye, we're going in with a little burnt umber, some raw umber, and the raw sienna. Of course, it's Mars black and ultramarine blue for the actual pupil, and I'm really taking my time defining the edge of the pupil and the eye socket. And once you get into the tear duct, we've got that distinctive tear line for cheetahs that we really need it to retain. Now that you've got this close up, you can really see how very blue that the lighter areas are that are in the shadows. And it's this very blue tone compared to the very orange tone where it's directly lit, this is going to create additional dimension to the surface of the subject. Now there's something that I did here that I didn't realize at the beginning that I did, and that is I kind of had to make the eyelid here a little bit more convex and less of a straight line. By creating this straight line and that straight edge, it gives this cat a very hard look, almost like it's stalking prey or it's got its vision dialed into something. In order to create a more softer kind of gazing off into the distance feel, I'm going to have to convex that eyelid just a touch. It literally is only going to be a stitch of the canvas that I have to adjust it by.
Now there's something to be noted about using the correct type and quality brushes. At this point, I'm spending an awful lot of time correcting strokes and fighting the bristles on a 20-0 Lancaster brush. This brush is at least two decades old, it was not originally mine, and I hadn't had much experience using it. It has a hog hair sable mix, which I thought would work in my favor, but as you can see, the brush is not bending at the body like the brown handled Masters Touch 20-0, which is a synthetic sable mix. The hair here is bending at the ferrule, causing the tip to splay out, giving me less control of my stroke. They leave a very dried brush effect, even if I'm saturating the brush, and I really didn't like what it was doing. With it being a 20-0, I was hoping I could get it, the bristles to twist down and still retain that five point that I wanted, but yet it still flared out, and I decided to cut my losses using this brush and change it out for a number three round sable synthetic blend. This brush was very frustrating to use. At this point, I'm still looking at refining the color mapping, and there needs to be a definite balance between the warm colors where it's directly lit from the sun and that shadow area. In refining the color mapping or underpainting, I'm looking for the transition points from one area to the next. I need those areas to move smoothly, so when I get to the detail, it makes sense. Now here's a note about bad reference shots. This shot was shot from about 300 yards away through glass. Uh, it had very soft light in the enclosure where I was shooting it from in a building. So the detail in it was very soft. None of the hairline that I'm filling in right now was actually in there. And I have to go back on my knowledge of cheetah anatomy, not even cat anatomy, cheetah anatomy, to make sure that I'm filling in the detail wrong. And this actually comes back and bites me because I went with standard cat anatomy not the directionality of cheetah fur, so that line that's right in front of the left ear caught me off guard a couple of times. This is a classic example of a reference shot that is a good reference shot, but not necessarily a good shot for a print. So what you'll see is you'll see a lot of shots back and forth where the canvas looks very wet and then all of a sudden looks dry. What I'm doing here is I'm doing a lot of glazing. Now, the nice thing about glazing is it's easier to correct under layers, but I also have to make sure that I'm using translucent colors. Now, of my total color palette, there are only about half of my colors that are translucent and work wonderfully as glazes. Now, the opaque ones are great for giving more body and more substance to my subject, but when I'm doing layering and glazes, I need to focus on the translucent ones. So the translucent colors in my palette are the cadmium yellow, the burnt sienna, the burnt umber, and the ultramarine blue. The opaque ones would go into the titanium white, the yellow oxide, and the raw sienna. The burnt umber also lends itself to being more opaque. And the reason these colors are important and the translucence is important because I wanted to have a real lick effect. I want the bottom layers to show through. If I use all of the opaque colors, it cancels out the bottom layers, and this can make it look very heavy and cakey. So I'm going to try to avoid those colors where I want my bottom layers to show through. I did kind of flip it for a bit while I was filling in some areas of the neck. Now if I decide I'm just not getting enough light in my areas of glazing, I can always switch from my titanium white to the zinc white. Keep in mind your zinc white is the translucent white, titanium white is the opaque white. Now before I got into a lot of fine detail with this, I did lay back in with my line drawing and double check my measurements. I did find out I was off a little bit on some few things, so you'll kind of notice that the neck tapers in quite a bit, and it looked a little bit like a sock puppet. So I did go back in, double check my anatomy, and found three specific points that I had mismeasured. So one of the reasons why we never got really past 
uh, underpainting with that Akira tutorial is because once you get past your underpainting, you're really just dialing in, refining, refining, and refining. It gets very, very redundant. I didn't think it would make for a very good tutorial. One of the things that really makes rim lighting work a lot is a huge amount of contrast. So while this tawny background works and it works well color wise, it did not make the rim lighting pop the way I wanted it to. And so I had to go back in and create with some glazing layers, a little bit of contrast in that background so that the rim lighting worked the way it was supposed to. Now with doing pieces that are charity pieces, I really want to give myself a time limit. I don't want to be on this thing for 12 to 15 hours. Uh, I didn't get as detailed as I possibly could have. So if you're looking for that ultra photorealistic piece from me, this is not going to be it. If I compare my reference picture to the actual rendering, there's going to be a little bit of artistic interpretation, probably more than some people would like, but there's plenty of opportunities to do a much better rendering of a cheater other than doing it for small works. This is both a great opportunity to do a tutorial on rim lighting as well as a big cat and still have something to contribute to small works. So one of those things about rim lighting is that it really blows out the edges of your subjects. So it's going to really enhance the texture that your subjects may have. If your subject has fur, it's just going to take things like uh, eyebrows or whiskers and just really blow those out, which will enhance the texture that you have or have not created in your subject. I just want to make one other point about quality brushes. So at some point when I was doing the background, I was switched out to a size six round that had sable hair in it. And sable hair and natural haired brushes don't necessarily last over the years. And again, this is another brush that I've had for 20 some years. And once I'm using it on glazes, the problem is, is that parts of the sable brush actually started to kind of break off and they were leaving little bits of brush hairs all over the painting. It was frustrating because not only does it cause the pigment to kind of cake up around it, even if I'm using a glaze, it causes a stop where the glaze doesn't flow properly. It creates this additional black speck on my piece. So I actually wound up undoing everything I laid in with that six zero round sable and going back in with the synthetic, which wasn't going to break. In order to make these spots look like they're far more part of the coat, we did lay it in with the Mars black, but we also need to go through with a diluted black that's got a little bit of the burnt umber with it and make it kind of a thinner layer. Again, another glaze so that it looks like it's layered into the lower coat, that blondish tawny coat. If I just layer these in as sections, without any kind of jagged line layering them in, they're literally going to look like stickers on it and it's not going to have any depth. Now one of the things that you may or may not be able to tell that I'm doing in this painting is that when I'm using these fine, fine brushes like the double zero and the, and the three zero, is I'm taking it and I'm just twisting the brush a little bit in my fingers in order to keep the tip of that paintbrush sharp. So we need to just reinforce a little bit on this, this rim lighting. I'm going to kind of pop around on that rim lighting a lot, see how much I need to reinforce it.
So again, just a little bit of the ultramarine blue and the raw umber mixed together with the extender to kind of push the layers back and forth. Now I haven't built up a lot of texture in the neck yet. And the thing is, is that cheetahs have a very short coat compared to other cats that would have a rough like a tiger or a lion. And I had to be a little tricky about how much texture I wanted to build up in the neck. I could have easily left it like this and it would have been fine. I don't think anybody would have batted an eyelash at it. But I really wanted to be able to bring the texture from the forehead and the rim lighting into the neck so it didn't just look like I copped out on the neck. So I did decide to take a little bit of the bunched up area where this, this cheetah was turning its head toward me just a bit. He has His back was actually fully on me, but of course this is a side view. So there is a part of his neck where the skin bunches up and of course then the fur bunches up and it creates a, a very textured effect on the neck. So in order to create that, I need to figure out where my action line is and find out where the actual shadow line is. So now going in just to create kind of that bunching of the fur. I've seen this happen a lot with artists that are struggling on how to make fur. Deal with your fur in clumps rather than individual hairs. If you look at the hair as shapes rather than individual hairs, you'll have a lot easier time creating your depth and your punch. And then you can go in and you can layer in individual hairs. You see I'm going in with a much larger, it's like a, a three or a six round brush. And all I'm doing is just creating in a shadow line to create some action and then going in with a smaller brush just to create a little bit of texture. Deal with your fur as shapes and areas rather than individual hairlines. And as much as it may look like I'm putting in a lot of lines here, I'm really only putting in some general shapes to inflect texture I'm not spending a lot of time actually putting in each individual line. A small grouping of lines in one direction will have your viewer really kind of generally associating that set area going in that direction. A good use of the titanium white and a mix of the ultramarine blue and the raw umber will push forward and bring back your fur and your perception of depth. One of the things I did decide that I needed to kind of touch base on and one of the things that's in the works on the editing board is kind of an episode going over different kinds of brushes with different kind of bristles so that you kind of have a more slow motion way of seeing the action in some of these brushes rather than this sped up one and mostly to help you kind of pick out your brushes when you're shopping for them.
you know, what kind of action does a hog hair brush have? One does a sable have? What does a synthetic bring to the table? So that, after I uh, got through all of this, is one of those things that got put on the ch chopping block. Going in and putting in some detail in that eye. Again, I realized that I needed to convex that eye just a little bit in order to make it look more inquisitive and not such a hard line as if it was staring down prey. Really only adjusting that eye by one or two stitches in the canvas, so a very, very minor, minor touch-up. But it makes a world of difference. When doing the transition in lighting on the nose, we're going to use a little bit of ultramarine blue and the burnt sienna. And now just going in and putting in some eyelashes and whiskers. Some of that final detail is just going to bring the realism. And that's just about going to wrap this up. Hope you guys were able to take a little bit away from this and enjoyed watching it. If you guys want to follow me out on Facebook, it's Morning Hawk Creations. There's going to be kind of a tag at the end of this. And if you want to see more from me, feel free to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, guys.